Okay, everybody, it is Monday. We have a weekend's worth of news for you. Okay, and first up, big news from my friends at Sequoia. A shout out to Doug Leone, who just did a killer episode of This Week in Startups. You can search for Doug Leone, This Week in Startups on YouTube to hear it. Uh, Sequoia has launched a new catalyst, basically an accelerator, but probably for seed stage companies, not early stage companies like Y Combinator, Techstars, and Launch Accelerator. And we're going to break down the implications because this is groundbreaking news for startups. Yeah. And then we have groundbreaking news for climate startups. The SEC, as we are recording on Monday, is discussing and potentially even going to vote on mandatory climate disclosures for public companies. This is huge. Groundbreaking day for sure. And we are sticking to our roots every day, trying to get a startup of the day in. You can submit your ideas for Startup of the Day to producers at thisweekinstartups.com. Our Startup of the Day is in the climate space, and it is a company using limestone. Limestone, like the, the brownstone I grew up in in Brooklyn, to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's such a good climate day, but also we're going to have a little leadership talk. Mm. We're wrapping with some interesting ongoings with incoming Disney CEO, the new guy, Bob Chapek, and former CEO Bob Iger, and we break down the difference between the Bobs, how new and different management can impact a company. It is going to be a great show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Coda is the all-in-one doc for teams. If you've got a stack of niche workflow tools, or if you're buried in docs and spreadsheets, Coda is the doc that brings it all together. Startups can get a $1,000 credit at coda.io slash twist. Our crowd helps you invest early in pre-IPO companies alongside professional VCs. If you're interested in investing, you can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash twist. And open phone. As a startup founder, a lot of mistakes are easy to roll back but using your personal cell phone number as your company number isn't one of them. Open Phone makes it easy to get business phone numbers for you and your team right on top of your existing devices. Visit openphone.co slash twist to get 20% off for your first six months. That's openphone.co slash twist. So our first news story, I'm super interested in your thoughts about this. Sequoia debuts hmm. ARC. Which okay. is a London and Silicon Valley based program to find and mentor outlier startups. They're calling it a catalyst, not mm. an accelerator. Although, uh, as I heard on the equity pod with Alex Wilhelm today, <laughs> it sounds a lot like an accelerator program. What is interesting is uh, a couple of things. One, this sort of outlier founder mentality. They're looking for seed stage companies. And when they seed those companies, they're going to give them a million dollars each per cohort. Mm. And the cohorts will be 15 companies. So a $15 million investment, 15 companies at the seed stage to go through this program where they sort of intensively get to meet CEOs. They get a field trip to a legendary company to sort of see it all in action. Um, their first on-site visit will be to Klarna, where startups will spend time with CEO Sebastian Simitowski and other executives. And it'll be co-run by Sequoia Partners, Jess Lee and Luciana Lisandru. What do are we worried? <laughs> uh, well, this is great. And it was we I just went on a rant. I think it was on VC Sunday School with yeah, people complaining about super pro rata. And I said, listen, work harder, do more work. If you uh, want to compete, please compete. And I said, literally, I actually invoked Sequoia. I said, you know, I, I, I uh, don't expect to win every deal versus Sequoia if somebody's doing a series B or a series A. And, uh, you know, this competition is great for ultimately founders and ultimately for innovation. Uh, so this is an accelerator. Let's not mince words, but mm -hmm. Sequoia does like to, uh, you know, based on my knowledge of working with them, uh, which is pretty um, deep, they do like to do new innovative things. In fact, the scout program, which gave me my start in investing, I was the first Sequoia scout um, famously in the, and uh, did a bunch of investments there. I think I did 17 or 18 and uh, three became unicorns, a uh, pretty good track record. I did I think three of the first seven became unicorns. So they do very innovative things and they like to brand them uniquely. I remember having a conversation with Ruloff 
And he said, we're going to call it Scouts. And I was like, I want to be called a Ranger. So I'll do it if you change the name to Ranger. This is what an idiot I am. I was like debating this incredible Otherwise, opportunity. no, I'm not going to do it. I was like, I don't know if I want to be called a Scout. And he's like, well, you know, like in baseball, they have Scouts. They look in, they look for talent. And I was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, so I was like the name Ranger better, but uh, in hindsight, Scout's better. You're, so, you're a content guy through and through, man. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, the first thing I can think of is the branding. Um, so ARC is a good name. I like it. It's an accelerator. Uh, another thing I like about this is uh, the size of the program. It's going to be approximately 15. So maybe they'll mm -hmm. do 10, maybe they'll do 20. Who knows? I guess they'll look at the quality that comes in. 15 is a lot. Um, I would have kept it at 10 maybe. But, you know, they have resources. So the million dollars is great for how much? What's the valuation here? So mm -hmm. that's left out. I don't see that anywhere here. I'm going to guess they do 10% of the company for a million. And then what stage are they going to accept people? So they're asking for you know, uh, outlier founders. So that's branding, right? Who doesn't want to be considered an outlier? We're looking for rebel founders. We're looking for, you know, this is just, uh, you know, kind of like branding uh, and trying to get people to apply. But this is absolutely a shot across the bow of Y Combinator. Because Y Combinator said, we're going to give this uh, 375k note. And I said, you know, when we talked on Sunday, right, Molly, mm -hmm. that gives less room for the other seed funds. And so here, if Y Combinator is going to move upstream and, and compete with Sequoia on Series A's or seed rounds, and arguably we do that too, everybody's just going to do everything and we'll see if they stick to it. That is, I would say, the hardest thing about an accelerator is being able to keep up the energy to do it. It is hard to do. You got to staff it. Uh, Jess, I know she's amazing. So I think uh, they've got a great person there leading it. I like the visit to a legendary company. We do something similar. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, we bring our startups to two different venture firms uh, for them to meet them. And I think it's great. It's great if you're a founder. I would love for the founders coming out of our accelerator to go to this one. Uh, and I think why co combinator companies could go to this one. So this seems like because of the amount of money putting it being put in that it would go for more seed stage companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but you never know. They might have people who are previous founders who want to do this. And that's probably something that Sequoia heard over and over again as a theme. And they, by the way, they did used to incubate companies at Sequoia. So yeah. like Dropbox famously, you know, was based at Sequoia um, for, you know, the first year or something after they went to Y Combinator. So I wonder if they had founders who they had invested in or people who were on at companies like a DoorDash, you know, the number seven person at DoorDash. And they said, I'm going to go to Y Combinator. And Sequoia was like, oh, but we could have invested in them, you know? So if we had a program, we might have been able to give them their first million dollars. So great job, yeah. Sequoia, and I wish them great success with it. And <clears throat> then the question becomes, does Sequoia do the next round or not? And then mm -hmm. the signaling issue. So Sequoia puts a million dollars into your company, you go to this one. Then it's time for Series A, and you're going to raise, you know, 5 million. Does Sequoia, Sequoia doesn't invest, you spent eight weeks with them, 10 weeks with them. What does that say to the rest of the market? So the signaling problem has always been the issue. And I don't think it's insurmountable, but I do think it's something for founders to be aware of. If we as launch fund and, you know, launch incubator stop investing in a company, people don't expect us to fund the company, you know, through Series A. We very rarely will even co-lead Series A as we do, but it's not our bread and butter. So that will be the issue, um, is that if you go through this program and then you don't get the Series A from Sequoia, what does that say? It says well, you're I mean, maybe not good enough for Sequoia, right? Right. And it also raises the question of, is Sequoia going to do something similar to what we do and what YC does, which is the, so yesterday, by the way, on VC Sunday School, in episode 1413, if you haven't heard it yet, you almost want to because it is becoming like the <laughs> pre-reading for this episode, because then it does raise it. So there aren't very many details about, for example, what percentage Sequoia takes with that million dollars and whether they have follow on rights that they take. Mm. Um and I think those are both open questions, but you don't you, like you don't see this as competitive. And I mean, I know that like, let's just say if I were not if I were having this conversation with someone who wasn't hadn't been a Sequoia Scout and didn't have a deep relationship with that company, I'd be like, are they coming for us? Like, are they on our territory? Because a founder like is a founder really going to want to take, you know, however much from us or YC and have six percent of the company locked up and then go to this million dollar accelerator program for some other percentage that we don't know but i would imagine kind of high for a million bucks like is it really a follow-on accelerator or is it competition we'll find out um you yeah. know it's, it's a small number of uh companies but 
all is fair in capital yeah. allocation. So, Absolutely. you know, everybody should be going after everybody. Everybody should uh, provide products and services that support founders. That's what we're in the business of doing. And I do think, you know, the, the real person this is competitive with, and I think this is really a shot across the bow right. of, of Y Combinator. I think, you know, people don't know this, but Sequoia saved Y Combinator at one point. Paul didn't have any money. Um, and Sequoia became like a major LP for some period of time and, uh, you know, was a huge backer of YC. Mm. And then YC didn't want to have, wanted to have like maybe not venture uh, VCs because they wanted to have that marketplace. And I think maybe, you know, YC, you know, investing more money in these companies is going to be the future. And I said it, you know, like on the podcast, like, well, why should we invest in and help mentor a company and then not? be able to participate in the seed round. It mm -hmm. seems unfair. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, for founders, they should play these uh, programs off of each other. You should try to get into Techstars, Sequoia, YC, uh, and Launch Accelerator. And if you get into one, great, do it. If you get into two, pick whichever one you think works better for your startup at what stage it is. And, you know, if you think that's Y Combinator or Sequoia or Launch Festival, go for it, you know, yep. uh, Launch uh, Accelerator. Last year, I interviewed Coda CEO Shashir on episode 1160, and we spoke about the productivity renaissance going on in big tech right now, and that's what Coda is all about. In Coda, your text and tables live together in the same document, and it helps any team collaborate more efficiently. They've got thousands of templates to work with, or you can take the playbooks published by some of the best innovators out there, and you can use them for yourself. Coda works right out of the box and is completely customizable. So you're going to create a wiki or a knowledge hub for your team. You can onboard new hires quickly, and you can adapt fast to any major or minor change in your business. Here's how we use Coda at This Week in Startups. My guy Presh made us an upvoting system on Coda for questions and topics for Twist. You go to thisweekinstartups.com slash questions, and you can submit questions and topics that our producers might include in the show. And people can vote them up and down. How awesome is that? And you can go find that template on Coda's website, and you can start your own Q&A for your podcast or maybe an internal meeting you're having. That's the power of Coda. They're going to start you on second base, third base. You're going to be on the way home in some cases. Coda has an amazing startup program. They're going to help you optimize and support your docs. Just go to coda.io slash twist, and you're going to get $1,000 in credits. I love this $1,000 credit. C-O-D-A dot I-O slash twist coda.io slash twist and get that thousand dollar credit now i don't know how long it's going to last it is interesting too i will say one last thing about arc before we move on is that they are um they are also deliberately putting out a, a, a more international focus which i think is interesting they're debuting in london they're saying they're looking for founders from all over the world they're going to accept applications from everywhere in europe including russia fyi um and so Did they say that, that? yeah <laughs> wow well i mean let me yeah. think that through what do you think of that molly Accept I mean, applications for a Russian company or Russian founders, but they mm -hmm. would be ones who are not operating in Russia. I don't know if they, I mean, they didn't really make that distinction. She said, hmm. we're going to accept applications from everywhere in Europe, including Russia. This hmm. was Lissandro, I think, saying this. Um, I wonder uh, what she when said, was, I wonder when she, when that interview was. Great founders come from everywhere. This is in TechCrunch today. Hmm. Okay, Monday. so they yeah. specifically asked her about that, given what's Sorry, going yesterday, on. yesterday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I guess they asked her. So I would say if I met a Russian founder and they were building the company in London, which I think where this is going to be based part of the time, mm -hmm. would I have a problem investing in a Russian founder? No. no. Would I want to invest in a Russian founder running Uber in Russia? No. So I think it, that it's would a, be That's the, just a business risk at this point. Yes. Well, there's the right? business like risk and then. do I want to support the economy of Russia during a time when we talked about sanctions having a profound impact. Right. Ice Queen from our Nodi gang says they corrected themselves and said only Russian founders who are in Europe, not okay, in Russia. Great. Well, that's right. interesting. Which, of course, like, of yeah. course, fine. Right. It's not, we're yeah. not, <laughs> we're not doing the full on McCarthy situation. Like I have a much, I, I mean, I, not only do I think we should invest in Russian and Chinese founders, <laughs> North Korean founders, Saudi founders. I actually think, America should recruit those founders out of those countries exactly. and bring them to the West. Because every time we take some legendary world-class mind, founder, ambitious person out of those countries and put them into America where they can be free to pursue stuff without being worried about their company being taken from them uh, by the authoritarians that run their countries, uh, that 
builds up our case for democracy and freedom, and it builds up our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So 100%. I think that should be that's like the most American thing I think a fund could do, or a college is to yeah. recruit the smartest people. And we should go on. That should be like an American uh, imperative, mm -hmm. new imperative, get the smart, ambitious people out of those countries as quick as possible. Okay, here is a uh, story that I know. Any other questions or on the Sequoia thing? Congratulations mm -hmm. to Sequoia. I think it's great. Yeah. Congratulations. Super to Founders, interesting. More choices. Yeah, we love it. Uh, I would like to find out what the percentage is because I wonder if they're going to negotiate each million dollar deal as if it's a seed round. So what this would, I think that's what they're doing. Actually, now that I think about it, I think they're uh, doing seed they're rounds. They're priced rounds, basically. I think they're doing, well, they put a cap on whatever. So you could say, I right. want 8 million. I could say, I want 10. Another person could say 12. Another person could say 7. So if they're actually doing that, and then that's the accelerator, great. And then what mm -hmm. is the goal of the accelerator? To raise money, to finish their product, to build their team. Company you know, to design, those. which is the part. Of, that's the other like kind of interesting wrinkle here is that it's super focused on this idea of company design, like how which you is put what together the company. Yeah. Right which is what we do. Yeah, a big part yeah. of what we do. We, we basically have them build plans, which Great I got idea. from Doug Leone, right? Doug Leone taught me, hey, build a plan and I have all of our founders build a plan. So yeah, I love the fact that they're doing it. I, I, I love competition. It's Let's fantastic be best for everybody. Well, yeah. I mean, pricing each, each round other. would be, pricing each round would be very innovative because when you run an accelerator, if you open up the can of worms of everybody gets to negotiate their deal, it's just chaos. Yeah. So we don't negotiate those deals. And if we say, if you want to negotiate a deal and you want to start the fundraising process, let's just move you over here to doing a seed round and not coming to the accelerator. Because then you'd have people, you know, sitting in the same class and one person negotiated a, a deal twice as good as the other. And okay, that means we, you know, think twice as much of that founder because they're mm -hmm. a better negotiator. It's just a little bit hard Awkward. to manage that. But if it yeah. is a seed round, they could easily manage it. So if it was a seed round with an eight week, uh, architecture of your company, I would say this isn't competitive with YC Techstars and Launch Accelerator. I think that might be what's going on here. Interesting. Okay. See, yeah, I'm glad mm -hmm. we're getting to the to spend a little more time on this because yeah, it does feel I mean, details are slim, right? I read their blog post. And it is they don't say anything about percentage, they don't say anything about round, they don't say anything mm -hmm. about how they're going to treat each individual company, but it very specific. I feel like given the money involved, and the specificity of the program, it would make more sense if it is. I can tell you little, what I'm and doing. They're saying it's seed stage. They keep saying seed stage yeah. over and over. Oh, okay. So then that's what it is. So I can tell you what the first thing I'm doing after we stop taping this podcast is I'm going to DM Jess and I'm going to say, hey, here are yeah. three companies from our accelerator that I think would be perfect for your ARC program. Exactly. I look at this as graduate school. So if we're undergrad and this is grad, this is like me running, you know, like a really good undergraduate school and like they're, you know, Oxford or something, some graduate school. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, let's send our smart kids there. That would yeah, be amazing for us because a lot of our That's what I was founders, wondering about the best friends thing is like, how can we, yeah, yeah, be a feeder. It's like Harvard to GSB or whatever. Harvard or, to GSB, look at you. Hey, it's time for another R Crowd deal of the week. Right now, you can join R Crowd's investment in DID. According to the deal memo, DID has patented reenactment technology, and their tech uses AI and deep learning to turn still photos into videos. DID does this for Fortune 500 companies, and they also have multi-million dollar deals with movie studios, social media companies, and online genealogy platforms, according to their deal memo. And you can invest in DID at rcrowd.com slash twist today. All over the world, companies like DID are innovating and driving returns for investors. And our crowd analyzes many of these companies, then they select the ones with the greatest growth potential, and they bring them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to the $50 billion video and synthetic media industry. Our crowd identifies innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest, and that's early. So if you're an accredited investor, you can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash twist and review the current deals. That's OURCROWD.com slash twist to sign up for free. And this next story, uh, which I think Molly is going to love, the SEC will vote on mandatory disclosures of emissions and climate risks for public companies. According to the Wall Street Journal, the proposal would force public companies to report, number one, greenhouse gas emissions from their own operations, two, mm -hmm. emissions from energy they consume, three, uh, and to which I guess would be energy coming into your power plant and where the emissions came from, and to obtain independent certification of their estimates. Okay, there's going to be a good business for somebody Huge. like Ernst and Young. 
And in many ca- in some cases, companies would have to report greenhouse gas output of both their supply chains and consumers, known as scope three emissions. Wow, the downstream and the upstream of their emissions seems, sounds very comprehensive. The SEC started considering the proposed rules in a meeting on Monday morning. Companies would have to include the information in SEC filings, such as quarterly and annual earnings reports. Currently, the SEC's four commissioners include three Democrats and one Republican. The lone Republican is Hester Pierce, who was on episode 1136 back in November 2020. Mm. She's very pro crypto. Uh, what are your thoughts? And then we'll get into some more details. This is huge. Hmm. So I, um, when I was at GreenBiz, this conference in Phoenix, hmm. a couple of weeks ago, I don't know, time yeah. has no meaning. Um, one of the sessions that I tried to go to was about SEC reporting requirements. And it was beyond standing room. Like if people could have taken out the door with a sledgehammer, they would have because this is the market maker moment right here. So Mm -hmm. a lot of companies have been pitching me on various measurement techniques, right? A dashboard for this and a a way to measure scope three emissions. Yeah, Yeah, there are tons of them. And the reason that there are tons of them is because they know that there is going to be some kind of requirement like this. Europe already has reporting requirements around Mm -hmm. scope one, two, and three emissions. And those are, you know, as you described them, the ones that you directly emit that ty- is scope one, uh, effectively, the type of energy you consume is so- scope two and scope three are these kind of like, big, broad, what's in your supply chain, what do your employees do? How do they get to work? Stuff like that, that's harder to measure. The second that rules like this come into place, businesses are going to be born like you cannot believe like they're already planning for it. They're already pitching around this. They're already saying, if you're a big multinational, you're having to do some of this anyway, or like your, you know, LP in a venture capital fund is saying, hey, you told us that your portfolio Mm -hmm. was going to be such and such percentage carbon neutral. Where's the proof? Yes. And I just I I think this is like, this is what jumpstarts economies. Yeah. Uh, And so according to the Wall Street uh, Journal, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler, mentioned in the past that investors and institutional asset managers representing tens of trillions of dollars have asked the SEC for standard climate disclosures in the past companies had self reported climate impact data on their own accord. You see that with Apple all the time and Google uh, buying all these solar farms, they they are proactive about it. I think because of founders and management, and the disclosures were always inconsistent from company to company, making them hard to compare. So if all this becomes standardized, of course, you know, that will help if you measure it, you can manage it. Of course, it could lead to gaming it, but it's going to lead to, I think, overall more awareness of this, which is always good if a majority of the agency's four commissioners vote in favor, which I guess would be three. <laughs> the SEC will open the proposal to public comment for at least two months before working to finalize a rule. So that'd be great. We can go uh, take a look at that. The SEC does move very slowly on these things as we learn from things like uh, the uh, Jobs Act, which allowed more crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, and accreditation. Mm-hmm. The SEC is very, very, I guess, slow <laughs> or charitably thorough. Yeah, uh, they d- they really take their time on these things, like years, and sometimes they even have to be pushed by you know uh, Congress, I guess, to to get these things done. But um, it seems like a good idea, and it doesn't seem like any public company would be too much of a burden. And I'm sure they could do this over time. In other words, like, hey, this year, we want you to report them. This year, we're going to review them. And then this year, we're going to audit them. And so, you know, when you're executing on these things, the devil's in the details. And I do like the idea of companies also being responsible for upstream and downstream. I thought that was the most interesting part of this. What do you think of that piece of it, having to at least maybe not take ownership of, but at least be aware of what happens when your product goes to your customer, or when you bought your batteries, or you bought your inputs, whatever they were, just having to know, like, was that built in some factory in India, Pakistan, or China? And what is their view of throwing carbon into the, you know, atmosphere? Yep, absolutely. I mean, there are a couple of pieces of this that I think are crucial. The measurement of the scope three emissions like has been a do- you know, way that companies try to get out of accurately measuring anything for a long time, right? They were like, mm. our campus uses buys offsets or our campus has solar and we, you know, our actual like on site, we recycle this much of our trash. 
and then never acknowledged like we're in a you know coal-fired factory in china or we're using like the least efficient you know airplane like cargo planes instead of ships or something to get our goods here Hmm. there are a couple like one europe is really pushing this this is one of those situations where the sec is moving because europe already has and and because this is starting to become a conversation about uh investment and also risk so i Mm -hmm. wouldn't be surprised if at some point we also see the fed move in this direction because they have made you know jay powell has made some like baby comments about how it is very possible that there need to be requirements around companies to report their actual financial risk related to climate whether that's because they're in danger of losing entire facilities to excess weather events or because you know they have people who live in like fire prone areas who i don't know can't work they have productivity issues like there's a lot of financial risk that goes into addressing climate so the fact that we're seeing movement on these two things are Mm. um is it's a big deal and it's look for us as investors it's a huge deal because policy drives markets governments become buyers policy incentivizes companies to get in the game where previously they wouldn't have had like a good reason to get in the game. What's an example so, of that? Like if you, if this w- was, you know, if we fast forward three years, this is a standard, this stuff is audited, yep. you know, and it's costing, you know, these public companies, whatever, a million dollars a year, $2 million a year to do this, putting aside that like there's some industry in preparing these reports. What would be if you think it through an example of a company having to change their behavior some meaningful way? Uh, because of this as a result of this kind of reporting yeah i mean they w- I, there's I sort have of one but i want to hear yours yeah right i mean there's big and small there's one you might have to actually start buying either renewable energy offsets or like get solar on your building that's the like super local scope three though you might have to change factories mm. like you literally might have to use a different manufacturer to create your products like it could really have major impacts throughout the sort of like global supply chain or you start emphasizing shipping over air mm. freight, but shipping is really expensive. So your costs go up. Like there's sort of a lot, it's a complicated ecosystem for sure. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. You brought up shipping because the my, what came to my mind was, okay, the press decides here are the biggest offenders. Here's our right. top 10 list of the people who are doing the worst job possible. And here are the 10 people who had the best climate uh, responsibility over year over year, right? We talk all the time here doing back of the envelope math, we're going to be able to do back of the envelope math and say, hey, look, Uber was talking about their inputs and their outputs and Lyft and DoorDash. And one of their things is their drivers and what percentage are using hybrids, what percentage are using EVs, and they have inputs, the restaurants, provide the food, whatever it is, uh, cloud kitchens. So now you would have people starting to do the press uh stories about this here are the people who are the big offenders okay now Mm -hmm. we're on the big offender list and now some you know greta thunberg um you know comes out or whatever the next person is and they're like we're going to sit on the front porch of this company (laughs) and highlight the fact that they suck (laughs) and they need to suck less (laughs) yep and they need to start sucking carbon (laughs) out of the atmosphere and then that person goes you know what they're hey i heard that startup on this wing startups that's taking kelp and putting it in the middle of the ocean can, can somebody just call them and give them 25 million dollars to put some kelp out there so we can get off this goddamn list of you know being one of the top 25 offenders and the other one i thought of was transportation like you were talking about okay yeah um flexport uh, is tracking all this stuff and you know there's a series of ships that are using that old oil that ryan peterson talked about that mm-hmm. is just mm-hmm. like this slurry mix that just pollutes the air i forgot the name of this oil from ships but they basically use one type of fuel to get out of port that's not so polluting and then when they're in the open ocean and nobody's watching they just spew this disgusting horrible oil slurry that i can't remember the name of anyway that slurry uh that they have uh they'd be like you know what let's find somebody without the slurry and then they'd go to the ships that don't and the ships that don't have it wouldn't be used and mm-hmm. they'd say, you know what? Okay, we'll upgrade the engines because we're losing business. So this, mm-hmm. I think, could have wonderful impacts of just raising awareness. And uh, I like it. I like it a lot. You and also I think it, start to get, it's related to that, actually, you start to get the concept of, you know, you get sort of carrot and stick. Like, this is a little bit, this is like, you need to report this stuff. Pretty soon, you could start to attach sticks to that. Like, you could start to say, hey, you're 
a climate criminal. Like we're going to create a you know new jurisprudence around this when companies continue to like flout the law and do whatever they want and it just like these are the these are the boring bureaucratic moves that actually yeah. have massive 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 impact. So I I like I got very excited about this story today because it's a big it's awesome. deal. And I, it, it's bunker fuel is the stuff that bunker ships. fuel. That's right. Bunker fuel. Container ships we're, use this super dirty fuel. Talking to a company that is interested in measuring emissions from ships on a ship by ship basis and helping them understand that because it's also a competitive advantage. Like you don't want to waste fuel. Many cargo ships I'm reading from Wired still use bunker fuel, the sludgy dregs of the petroleum refining process. Sludgy the noxious, dregs. <laughs> the noxious blend. It's th the noxious blend is dirt cheap, making it possible to charge next to nothing to ship goods internationally. Like, so there you go. It's like yeah. literally these are the dirty the dirtiest vehicles in the world are this horrible bunker fuel and like how yeah. we have not banned it is because the ships are you know chinese uh or from countries that don't care chinese companies mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't and know. they have a different worldview and you know well who knows I, uh, somebody can fact check me on that but i think you know the developing world maybe Sees. I think anybody who can go cheaper is going to go cheaper. And this is right, why these regulations start to matter. And so do carbon taxes, because it won't be the cheapest thing to use the sludgy dregs. Yes, because the shell game of, well, we just outsourced that to a company. We didn't know. We, we mm -hmm. don't, I mean, we don't know what they're using, you know. And now it's like, well, you do have to put your inputs. So if you got, that's, you know, your, if your iPhones came here on one of those. Yeah. Well, you know, you now have to put that in there. And I wonder if Apple actually and all these iphones coming from china if apple is letting slurry ships you know slurry fed ships ship our apple products here because they want to save a dollar per phone but this is great i i you know it's one of the things i love about having you here passionate about the climate stuff is i'm learning and scope three is really really cool um that they can uh start looking at the inputs and the outputs Listen, lots of founders are loosey-goosey with their personal numbers. We all know that. They put it on company documents, they use it for sales calls, and more. And that's where things get super messy. You, you don't know who's calling you, right? Is it a sales prospect? Is it a coworker? Or is it somebody from your kid's school? Is it spam? Well, Open Phone helps you create business phone numbers for you and your team. And it works through an app on your smartphone very elegantly or on your desktop. You just pick a number, you install the app, and you're done. There is no need to carry two phones like I do. And there's so many features you're going to love, including, you know how we all create catch-all emails like support at ourcompanyname.com? Well, you can do something similar for a phone number. You can have a shared phone number with multiple employees fielding those incoming texts and the calls. What a brilliant idea. See what Open Phone can do for you. It's already affordable at a starting price of just $10 a month per user. So affordable. And Twist listeners can get an extra 20% off any plan for your first six months by signing up at openphone.co slash twist. And if you have existing numbers from another service, no problem. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, Open Phone can port them over for free. Just head over to O-P-E-N-P-H-O-N-E dot C-O slash twist today. Openphone.co slash twist today. We should go to today's startup of the day, which is Heirloom. Let's do it. Uh, related. I, this is super related. So today's startup of the day is Heirloom. It's a climate tech company which uses heated limestone to remove carbon dioxide. What? From the atmosphere? <laughs> Explain <laughs> this to me. Jason's like, magic! <laughs> Wait, I, limestone? We, I, I, I grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. There were brownstones and there were limestones. And they would put limestone on the front of the buildings because it was beautiful and i don't know the rest of the history of it but i grew up in a limestone wow Tell me. really yeah, yeah. could yeah. have been a carbon sink this is yeah this is amazing it's heirloom like the tomato um spelled like the tomato but it is a carbon capture company because the big <laughs> the big secret the dirty little secret about a lot of our climate goals like the net zero goals that the you know world has agreed to um they actually depend on technology that does not yet exist to capture carbon dioxide from the air and store it somehow we are currently unable to do that at scale i think elon musk funded a contest to reward a company who could come up with the most efficient yes. direct air capture so there's a couple ways that people try to do it one is like capture the emissions as they come out of a plant but another is to try to like suck carbon dioxide out of the air and store it somewhere it's a super hard problem to solve 
This company announced a $53 million Series A from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is the Bill Gates Fund and Microsoft Climate Innovation Fund, to try to uh, do this capture, suck it out of the (laughs) air. And then they use limestone, which is cheap and widely available. They heat it super hot, 600 degrees, an electric furnace powered by renewable electricity. Electricity, that's key. The process then releases carbon dioxide, which is captured. The leftover calcium oxide is spread out. I'm just going to go through the technical details here. Spread out in these trays that are stacked 20 feet high and exposed to the air like cookies on a baking tray. And then over this long process, months to years, calcium oxide gets converted back to limestone as it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, It's very... So, and, and, you know, you know that my metric is gigatons, right? I like right. to talk about, like, don't talk to me about tons or even hundreds or millions. The California-based startup plans to remove 1 billion tons of carbon mm-hmm. dioxide at gigaton by 2035. Amazing. Possibly. I think this carbon capture. I have questions, but yeah. possibly. You know, uh, and the uh, X Prize is, is running the $100 million prize for carbon removal. Uh, that bestie e i guess underwrote which is super yep. cool yep. teams of people here's how to win to win the prize teams must demonstrate co2 removal at the 1000 ton per year scale model costs at That's the million tons, tons right. per year megaton scale and present a plan to sustainably reach gigaton per year scale in the future in the first phase of the competition teams must demonstrate the key components and i guess the number i want to know is how many gigatons do we need to remove um 50 50 51, gigatons 51 to, to zero is what we're looking at mm-hmm. 50 per year yeah with our, currently uh we emit 51 oh okay gigatons so you're saying we could be carbon neutral if we took 51 gigatons out yep got it so yep. here's that's just the, another that's like the bill gates metric does he is he calls it 51 mm-hmm. to zero so there is redu- having putting less into the atmosphere and there's taking out and we should yep. be going for big big swings at both yep is this a bit? This is a big swing. This is potentially a big swing. Now, right. what's interesting about this process is, and this is also in the Bill Gates book. It's a really everybody should go read. I can't remember what it's called, but the the climate book that Bill Gates wrote is just profoundly digestible. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like a really easy one to get the big concepts, like fifty one to zero, and and it also lays out and and plenty of other works on climate have done this too. That there are a couple things to look at when you evaluate a new technology. And of course, cost is one of them. Thank you, Nick. How to avoid a climate disaster. Like, does it cost more than the existing solution? But also the one of the big questions is how much space does it take? How much physical mm. space does it take to do this at scale? And so when they say, oh, okay, so we have these huge baking trays of uh, calcium oxide stacked 20 feet high and exposed to the air, and then we could pull out a gigaton in 13 years one gigaton in 13 years and i don't mean to be disrespectful about a pretty remarkable technology doesn't get us that far so like how do you scale this without needing massive amounts of land Hmm. and getting those gigatons out faster right so all of these is about scale all of these become scale we know that you can take carbon out of the atmosphere carbon sequestration sequestration yeah sequestration is proven technology, we can do it. We need to figure out how to do it at scale and yeah. have the energy it takes to take it out of the atmosphere and not cause more damage. Yep. Right. So like you could burn coal, I guess, to run these fans that pull it out or whatever, but that's not helpful because you're burning right. more than you're taking like out. these they're said they're using this furnace that's powered by renewable electricity. That's great. It's also okay. renewable ec- electricity like that is it I talked to this really interesting company that's like pre-seed right now, but what they're doing is they're creating a manufacturing technology that's purpose built for cheap renewable energy, Mm. which isn't always consistent. Now I'm just nerding out, but you know how like solar and wind, the sun doesn't shine all the time. So they're going to make batteries and then batteries, there's a a carbon cost to building batteries, right? They're literally creating a process that's purpose built for intermittency. Got it. And so, like, oh. if these guys were doing that, if they were like, we know that there's intermittency, but we have designed our process to work Amazing. around that. Amazing. That's like, it's, again, it's like layer stacked on layer, stacked on layer, kind of like these baking trays. Ha ha, accidental yes. metaphor. Anyway, yeah, well, love it. I, mean, I love that it's happening because we have 
to have this. We will and, not. And, you know, like message to Germany. It. If you want to turn off all these nuclear power plants, well, why don't you leave them on and let the carbon folks uh, who are doing this sequestration set up camp there? Yeah. So they could have like really cheap energy because these things are already paid for. I saw a story over the weekend that made me think of you. Who is it? It's a uh, Belgium. Belgium's going to extend the life of its nuclear react- reactors by Lord. another decade. I'm just a super pragmatist. And, you know, I, I was actually going to make a note of this at the beginning of the show. We are going to talk about Ukraine on the show, but we're also going to keep talking about other things and our hearts, prayers, wallets, everything are, you know, obviously thinking about and uh, praying for the people of the Ukraine and that this resolves itself quickly. And it's yeah. beyond our mandate to sit here and talk about politics. If you want to talk about politics, I have another show. You can talk about it on there. <laughs> Uh, or there's a lot of other places, but I mean, we will talk about right. things in relation to Ukraine. Since we have to do, be able to do more thing, more than one thing at a time. We yes. really do, and we can. Nobody can afford to put the climate crisis on hold. Among exactly. other things, yeah, like there are thousands of people dying in you know this war and other wars, and then there's also the existential threat of millions of people dying from climate. So we have to fight many wars. Sadly. Uh, as humans on planet Earth. Okay, longtime Disney CEO Bob Iger and his replacement Bob mm-hmm. Chapek have had a falling out, according to sources, since Iger stepped down as CEO. Uh, CNBC uh, reported this. They said uh, they noted a dozen anonymous sources spoke to them for the article. I hate this anonymous sources stuff, but generally mm-hmm. CNBC has a pretty high benchmark for this. And they took a, made a point of putting a dozen up there. So hopefully these are sources inside the company. I would give CNBC the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think you have to think about every publication. I might not give that to, say, Business Insider or Huffington Post, but I would to CNBC based on their track record of getting things right. According to the story, they're saying I- Iger was an EQ genius, a uh, warm, great leader, people person that seems on track with what you see publicly from him uh, and reading his book and the uh, fact that he was able to manage talent and also manage the talent that owned the IP that he wanted to buy. Uh, right of a lifetime, great book to read about this. Um, Chapik is a great operator, uh, but according to sources, not uh, especially a great people person, at least when compared to Iger. So there's been some backlash over his decisions that uh, we'll go into later in the story. There was the public spat over Scarlett Johansson's contract lawsuit and uh, consolidating all the PL sheets across all of Disney's entertainment branches under one group, which people always hate. And that was Scarlett Johansson's contract for Black Widow. It seems like there are sort of two things happening. One is Chapek's management since he took over, but the other is the origin of the spat, which is, you know, as we know, Bob Iger stepped down as CEO in February 2020. He intended to continue on at Disney as an executive chairman and direct creative projects. It sounds like, though, he just has had a really long goodbye. So a few weeks after he stepped down, COVID hit, the park started closing, and Ben Smith at the New York Times interviewed Bob Iger who essentially said, you know, this is a huge crisis with its impact on Disney. Obviously, I'm going to have to actively help Bob Chapek, new Bob, Bob too, and Mm. the company contend with it, particularly since I ran the company for 15 years. Mm. Now, let's compare and contrast Bob Chapek's response to, let's say, uh, our bestie, Barry, over at Peloton. Because... Mm. This by this, according to this account, Bob Chapek had like a fit over this. Really? Yeah. This is what caused the rift is Ah. Bob Iger saying, I'm going to stay on and help you run the company during this massive crisis. Now, there were a couple ways for Bob Chapek to respond, right? One is, thank God, nothing like this has ever happened before. I welcome all of the input from the guy who ran this company for 15 years, who's beloved. Uh, Great. We are going to do this together. And then you, you know, you like, look, you, you. You're feeling out your office, you're peeing on your territory, like I get it. You want this job and you've worked a long time for it. But evidently, he just could not take this. He was so, Mm. I don't know. I mean, He got tweaked by it. Maybe insecure. Yeah, he got so tweaked by it that their relationship has deteriorated ever since. Huh. That's strange. You know, that reminds, right, reminds me of what happened with Ben Simmons at the, uh, in the, in the Philadelphia 76ers where, you know, 
Embiid was like, here's all the things that went wrong in the game. And yeah, we missed the layup was like one of the 10 things that Embiid pointed out of why they lost that game. Um, and that tweaked Ben Simmons and he said, I'll never come back. So people are very sensitive these yeah. days. But if they're saying, if Chappick is not, if he's a hardcore guy with low EQ, then maybe he would just be like, yeah, whatever. He's helping me. <laughs> you know, like, why does right. he care? So it what doesn't does he seem like he's like a, a snowflake or like some, you know, uh, really soft person, but maybe like you're saying, Zigo was bruised or something, but it seems like a super overreacting. But, the, you know, this is like the he said, she said nonsense that like, we, who knows what happened? We have no idea. We and have no idea. Iger, Bob won, uh -huh. had postponed his retirement three times already. So if you put yes. this in succession terms, right? Yes. He's Logan Roy. Bob Iger is Logan Roy. Yes. And Kendall is there waiting for the job. And never he comes. keeps on not leaving yeah and then finally he gets the job and then logan roy's like i'm back hmm. you know so you certainly you could understand why that would be difficult however it has just continued to get worse and worse and then on top of that you have these sort of moves by chapek where people don't think he has good eq where there was that kind of like pretty ugly stuff about scarlett johansson and her contract about black widow and then also and I personally think this is just like a kiss of death move as a leader, the ultimate king move of taking away that PL from each individual division and centralizing it under one. I mean, that's like business weeds, I know, but having worked at several house of brands, that's a mess. Yeah. And it makes people furious because you effectively say to a bunch of grownups who are running their own businesses within a business, yes. sorry, no, we took that all away. It's a stupid move. I, you know, I, when you're running brand IP, you need to let people have excellence in units. So as an example, AOL bought Engadget, Autoblog, Joystick, and other blogs. And they had also bought TechCrunch and a couple of other brands. And they were keeping it together. Then when Jim Bankoff left to start Verge, uh, they started consolidating everything and doing this exact thing. Condé Nast learned long ago, you give Vanity Fair their own floor and you give Vogue their own floor. And right. Vogue has one culture and Vanity Fair has another and The New Yorker has another. And there are like three independent organizations. They have their own accounting. They have their own HR, whatever it is. They, you know, and I don't know if they exactly have HR and accounting, but they have their own cultures and ways of operating. And they're not um, forced to be under the same PL or whatever. This is what like authoritarian CEOs want to do. Yeah. It's just turn creative people into widgets. It doesn't work. No. Nope. Because they then become like, well, why should I put any work into this if it's just going to be the corporate overlords are going to just roll me every time I want to do something interesting? I'll give Bankoff a lot of credit. He seems to have kept, you know, at Vox and Verge. He's got a sports thing over there. I think SB Nation is his. And, uh, you know, all these different networks. He had curbed for a while. And they did consolidate, I think, some things into New York Magazine when they merged with it. But he's been able to keep these brands somewhat independent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a real art to do that. So you really want Marvel and Star Wars and Pixar all doing their own thing, having their own five gems, and then you get to have five great leaders in charge of five different sets of IP. Yeah. That's better for you because then if somebody does a great job, the other people can look at what they did, copy them. If somebody's not doing a good job, you fire them and it doesn't affect the other four units, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just easier to manage so it it does require though spending more money per unit because you need to have redundancy you have duplicative duplicate yeah, you know for sure people so but you know if you put the same person in charge of the star wars franchises as marvel that person is going to be like uh marvel's working star wars isn't i'm going to just start working more on marvel and the person working on star wars doesn't have to sink or swim mm -hmm. and you want people to sink or swim there needs to be one person in charge the buck needs to stop so what they should be doing is naming the ceo of pixar a c they should be doing the opposite they should yep. if i was running it yep. i would have a ceo of marvel i would have a ceo not president ceo which is what they did with uh susan mojeki at youtube they gave her mm -hmm. the title of ceo for a reason that thing was so freaking big and was such a juggernaut they said okay we'll give you the ceo title that's the power move there yeah. should be a ceo of Whenever a unit hits some level of scale, make a CEO. And then the Scarlett Johansson one t seemed particularly lame because this was the first time, I believe, they did a standalone 
uh, with a female lead. Am I correct in that? Brie so, Larson was in Captain Marvel. It was okay. less about that, but it was sort of more. I mean, it 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 added a layer of particular horribleness to correct. what was a pandemic induced decision in some ways, right? So this they said the studio because they released Black Widow simultaneously on streaming and in um, theaters, and her pay was dependent on box office performance. She sued and claim that the studio sacrificed the film's box office potential in order to grow the Disney Plus streaming service, a decision partly driven by the pandemic. And then Disney was like, no, you got paid $20 million. Yes. And like, and the, yeah, it, so it just didn't, it just was a bad look all the way around because it was sort of like, well, that's probably less than everybody else got paid. And also they just handled it very poorly and very publicly. Mm-hmm. And it was just sort of a pile on of bad the- decisions. Yeah, and you know what? They don't. They didn't even get credit for the fact that they gave her the sa- by by creating this tension and not settling it quickly and quietly. Mm-hmm. The, she got paid the same. I just looked it up as mm. Captain America and uh, Thor. So oh. yeah, I, and I'm I'm looking at that right now. They they Great. basically paid her the same as uh, Evans and Hemsworth for their single, which makes sense in today's day and age. Like, why wouldn't they? And then they should get some base pay and then it should be performance. And so if more people see Black Widow than or Black Panther or Thor, like, wh- you know, there should be some bonus based on performance. It makes total sense. Nobody can yeah. argue with that. They just but changed the did... performance metric by putting it out on streaming first, since the performance metric had always been box office. But now what they put in people's mind, I think, Molly, you tell me if your mind goes there. Because when yeah. there is a vacuum of information, people's minds will go to dark places. And some people will be charitable and go to a positive place. Given the history of pay discrepancies in Hollywood, Mm -hmm. most people's minds would reasonably go to a darker place than a charitable place. And so I would say, in my mind, and I'm a pretty positive thinking person, would they have done this to Iron Man? Would Robert Downey Jr. have to fight for his money like this? I, I I think the answer is no. Now, I also understand that he's a better actor than all of them. And he is the anchor and all that could be true. But I do think you you have to, this is where the EQ might come in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's been a history of incredible pay differences. And, you know, sometimes it might be based on box office, but other times it might not be. So you have to take that into account. That was my reading of it. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, these, I, to me, these are all of a piece. These are all chunks of the same story. Like you take away P and L from division heads that's the ultimate like king move right you want to get rid of siloing find a way to do it but but being like the king is bad you get so like tweaked and triggered by Iger, you know effectively offering to help you sure he hasn't gone away for a long time but there's a way to handle that without ruining the entire relationship Mm -hmm. and then finally instead of understanding all the layers that go into something like this like sure scarlett johansson got paid 20 million dollars the same base pay Mm -hmm. as these co-hosts but the back end pay is all based on box office performance. So you acknowledge, yeah. hey, this is a really tough time to be making a decision like this because we know it could look like this and we want to reassure Scarlett mm. and everyone else that this is not about inequity. It's a hundred year pandemic, da 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 da, right? And instead of just being like, she got paid the same, what's the problem? Like mm. it all adds up to a portrait of a guy who isn't that good at people. And what I actually find super interesting, like on top of all that, the cherry on the cake is like Bob Iger picked him. That's his hand chosen successor. Yeah. Well, he ran parks. I think this guy had run parks, which is a key piece of it. And he's an operational machine. So I think maybe the thinking was he was Tim Cook-esque and would be a good like uh, steward of the brand. Maybe he doesn't close the, you know, Pixar deal, but maybe he doesn't also have the iPhone not ship on time, you know? (laughs) Right. Uh, or have totally. supply chain issues. So I think a lot of times, and you have yeah. to look at Eisner took this company, I think it was like a billion dollar company when Eisner took it over and they were doing stupid stuff. And Eisner made it unbelievable. He, he you know, 10, 20, 30 X the market cap. But he was against the Pixar deal because he and Jobs couldn't get along and he didn't want to concede that Pixar had beaten Disney animation, which was obvious it had. And then it took Iger to come in and create a, a super aligned a super alignment with jobs and a lot of humility 
to to get to pace with jobs and really connect with him to get him to sell it. And once Pixar had sold, it made it easier for Lucas to sell because he saw Pixar and Marvel have great outcomes. And Lucas then was like, okay, I, I can trust them with my baby. I want the cash before I die kind of situation. Yeah. But remember, Iger wasn't Eisner's choice. Eisner was going with Ovitz, um, right. the ultimate deal maker. And that would have been pretty amazing because I wonder if Ovitz would have gotten the Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars deals done sooner <laughs> than Iger, or if he would have been, you know, worse. He's the ultimate deal maker. So we'll never know these counterfactuals, but I think the history of Disney needs to be made into this would be the ultimate series. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to make a Disney series, not approved. That goes from Walt and like an anthology series from Walt Disney creating it and then time splicing it back to Eisner, to Ovitz, to Iger and back and forth Marvel and just show that arc over, you know, that could be That'd like be fascinating, an amazing, you know, the 1940s to 2020s. How many years is that? 80 years of Disney? Yeah. Mar oh my Freaking Lord. Fascinating. I mean, you got a real, they are also the company that effectively like invented IP as a weapon. So you yes. got a little bit of IP issue with wanting to do this, but I no, do no, like no, it. No, 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 You can tell any <laughs> historical story. <laughs> That's true. We actually, That's true. you know what? This would be a great thing for us. To, we, 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 I always love the acquired FM guys doing these like two hour episodes where they explain the history of a company. We should do our own yes. week where we do each decade and do like a, a eight decade retrospective of disney e what they accomplished each decade and we'll just read all the books and like that's walk phenomenal it. and then yeah, boom really we've one. created the ip for the show Done. that's it oh look at us ip mm -hmm. look at us, look at us IP. being a little like a studio a little pipeline a i mean little studio over here mm -hmm. it also like just as a company building to go all the way back to our Sequoia sequoia's story yes. like as a company building exercise it is such an interesting uh example of all of the ways in that leadership Mm. can actually be a make or break like how you structure your company how yes. you think about empowering leaders yes. like amazon single threaded leader thing compared to you know the consolidation of divisions like eq versus iq it's just all in there it's mm. freaking fascinating hey everyone producer nick here I want to tell you about the SaaS Syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to thesyndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS Syndicate. And you can join Jason's Syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at thesyndicate.com. Producer Justin here. Know a cool startup? Check out OpenScouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at Remote Demo Day com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity. 